Welcome back to our class on machine translation. Today we finally gonna get to neural machine translation models and we will build them as extensions of neural language models that we encountered last time. So if you remember last time we talked about language models in a neural context we looked at various model variants, uh, feedforward neural networks that were really just the application of our toy examples of feedforward neural networks applied to words as input and words as output, and then uh, recurrent neural networks and a refinement of recurrent neural networks called long short term memory neural networks. So here was our feedforward neural network, neural language model, if you still remember. Um, so the idea is to predict a word, an output word given its history, so the four preceding words. So we have the four preceding words as input to the neural network. So the previous word and the ones before that, um, we first map these uh, into embeddings. Uh, this can be formalized as having the words encoded as a one, hat ve one, one hot vector that get passed to an embedding matrix. And then uh, we have a highly dimensional, typically 500,000 dimensional embedding of the word. That's now a kind of a more convenient uh, representation for neural networks. So we feed that into a hidden layer, have some activation function there, and then make an outward word prediction from there. With the recurrent neural networks, um, we simplify this, first of all. First of all, this looks not all that different from what we had before. We have an input word, so here a start of sentence symbol. We look up the embedding for it. Uh, we have then a recurrent state that is predicted by that and make a software prediction and predict the next word. So this is the first word of the sentence, but it gets more interesting when we predict the second word of the sentence because what's happening here with these recurrent states. So the recurrent state for the second word is not only informed by the preceding word, which was the first word, the, um, it's also informed by the previous recurrent state. And then we keep going and basically just pass information from the recurrent state uh, word by word through the sentence and so on. So here's the whole sentence prediction that we might make. So literally, we can apply this model to figure out what probability, for instance, is given to the sequence, the word, the house is big. Um, so we can look at the softmax predictions may, given to this word. Or we can also just use this in a generative purpose. So it's now popular to just let these run and see what kind of words they produce. And that obviously heavily depends on which training data you feed it, it into. And uh, whatever, if you feed it your collection of email, messages, then it's probably going to produce a fairly generic email about whatever, hello, can we meet on so-and-so at so-and-so, whatever, something like this. Okay, um, that's a language model. Um, we encountered language models in statistical machine translation already extensively, so that they're a very powerful tool to produce fluent language to ensure that the output of a machine translation system is fluent. Um, so how do we use them in translation models? Well, the very first, one of the very first translations models that I proposed did something very, very simple. They basically took this architecture of a neural language model and said, well, we're walking through a sentence. This is now, let's say we first go walk through, through the foreign sentence. And why not also predict the translation then? So we predicted the words of a sentence. Why not also predict their translations? So this is how it looks like. Um, the color changes at some point because we first walk through an English sentence. The house is big. So this is always the condition and context being given. And then we say, OK, end of sentence. We're done with the input sentence, the English input sentence. Now start predicting output words. And then we just basically wanted to produce German words from this point on. Thus, house is both. Uh, 
point and end of sentence. So uh, all we have to do, obviously, is get all of all our training data, all our sentences that are translated, concatenate the source of the target, and feed them into a neural language model, recurrent neural language model architecture. And we're done. Uh, this sounds like madness. Uh, it was proposed by Google in 2014 as a neural translation model. Um, there were not really any hard numbers on official test sets that were used at the time. The paper does remark that this works nicely for short sentences, but for long sentences falls apart. And it's kind of obvious to see why it probably falls apart for long sentences. So this um, recurrent state here in the middle basically has to encode the entire information about the input sentence. So the output sentence can be all, all the words predicted in the output sentence can be traced back to this particular state. So this is a state that has to encode the entire input sentence. And um, it has a fixed size. So if the sentence input sentences get really long, it's hard to see how all that information can be encapsulated in there. So it's somewhat believable that this might work for short sentences. But for longer sentences, the prediction paths get really far, uh, far. So here it predicts the word groß. And the main driver that predicts this is the word big here in English. And if you just trace back the computation path to get there, somehow information has to be transferred from big all the way through all these recurrent states to this word groß. So what's missing here? is um, we probably should have some form of alignment of input words to output words. So when I make a prediction over a particular output word, das Haus ist, the house is, now what word should come there? There should be something that guides the model to saying, well, this input word is probably the word that matters the most. So take that into account or pay a lot of attention to that. Um, this, the solution to that is the attention mechanism. And that was basically the breakthrough for neural machine translation. It was proposed about a year after uh, this very simple model and uh, gave, for the first time, competitive and sometimes better results than traditional statistical machine translation models. So this lecture is all about these attentional recurrent neural network architectures for machine translation. Um, so we're going to describe a fairly complicated model, but I'm going to do it slowly in parts. Uh, we're going to go over kind of architecture in forms of just looking at beautiful, colorful pictures, but then also going through the math. At the end, we're also going to discuss training of these models and uh, uh, issues with batching and uh, deeper models. So this is the model we're going to discuss today, a neural translation model with attention. So before we get to attention, let's slowly look at uh, uh, the two part big aspects of a neural translation model, the encoder and the decoder. If you go back to this picture here, you can view the encoder as this part here. This is the thing that encodes the input sentence, stores it in this state here and then decodes it here. So it takes then this state and produces a sentence out of it. So we're going to do this now slightly differently, but this idea of an encoder and a decoder stays with us. OK, so this is um, the input encoding that happens in this very naive, just concatenate, having a translation model just as a concatenation of input output sentence and using language model architecture for that. So we still want to take some of the ideas from here. So uh, so this is just processing a regular English sentence that we now assume is the source sentence for a translation model and uh, if it would be modeled with a language model. So the one thing that we're going to borrow from that is this idea here of recurrent states. So these recurrent states are kind of interesting. They, they're not just the input words, so they're informed at each point by the input word, but they're also informed 
by the context to the left. This is especially interesting if it comes to ambiguous words. If a word is ambiguous, maybe the left context tells us something about what the word means in this particular context. So it always it's an encoding of a word, big for instance, with additional guidance from words from the left. So these hidden states here are things that come out of these neural language models. So you want to have something like that. These encode the left context for each word. But we can also run it in the other direction. So if you now look at the arrows, and I'll point in the other direction down here. Um, so you can also run it in reverse. That gives us for each word the right context. Just think about it actually as a way of how can I enrich the representation of a word. I could just look up word embeddings and do neural machine translation just with the word embeddings. It's not impossible. But it is, it is more useful to have as the input uh, the word being additionally informed by its left context and by its right context. And this is, uh, in all its glory, already the encoder. So the idea is that we take the input sequence of words, um, which we now call xj, uh, j being for each position, so x0, x1, x2, and uh, look up embedding for them. So we have still have a fixed word embedding for each word, but then run it through a recurrent neural network. So we have two of them. One is the left to right encoder, and one is the right to left encoder. So the idea is that instead of having just a simple representation of the word like is, which is fixed no matter where the word is occurs, we now have a refined representation for this word that is informed by either the left context or the right context. Um, so as I said, we're going to go actually over the math for all these things we're going over. Uh, that also hopefully clarifies what is always illustrated by these images. So the input is uh, a sequence of words, xj. So this is kind of why we're calling them x is kind of classic machine learning thinking. You have an input x and you want to produce an output y. So x is the input, y is the output. So the words in the input are then called xj. So we have an embedding matrix. Uh, so we call that e with a dash on top. That's our uh, embedding matrix, and we just basically multiply the word representation, which is a one hot vector, into the with with an embedding matrix. Basically, another way to look at this is to say we're going to look up the embedding for words. We have a big table for our entire vocabulary, and look up embeddings for words. And then we have the recurrent neural network. So at each point in time. Each of these recurrent states takes two inputs, the word embedding and the previous recurrent state. So if you look at this here, I showed it now the left to right. So it here is the embedding, and here is the previous recurring state. So this is now the one to the left, j minus one. Uh, that is the input. So these are basically two vectors that get um, use uh, is the input multiplied with some matrix. This is a weight matrix, and then we apply an activation function on top of that. And uh, this could be, for instance, just uh, sigmoid or 10h, like we had in some of the neural network design. But there might also be more complicated things. So we're hiding quite a lot here in this function f. So this might be the whole LSTM cell construction. But and it does make sense to kind of look at this abstractly as we are applying a function to inputs that are the previous state and the embedding of the current word that we look at. And um, that function gives us an output vector. And that function is obviously parameterized by something, usually by first having a matrix multiplication and then activation functions. But there might also be more complicated things happening. So let's now move to the decoder. Um, we're going to do very similar things. I'm still motivated by what we did for our language model. So here we have to predict words one at a time. 
and we have some recurrent state that we walk through. And then given a recurrent state, we're going to make a prediction over output words. So uh, just as a reminder, what happens here is usually you have some matrix multiplication that takes the recurrent state vector, multiplies it with the matrix, and then the output vector gets normalized in a way that all its values add up to 1, so it can be used as a probability distribution. So what else do we want to have to help us make these predictions? Well, one is obviously the previously produced word. So this is now the embedding of the output word yi. So remember, as we did for the machine learning setup, we take input x, map it to output y. So the input words are called x, j, and the output words are called yi. So each output word um, is going to help us to make predictions. And uh, you see that the output word directly to, to produce, uh, helps with the prediction, contributes to that prediction, is basically another vector that gets used as an input for the matrix multiplication that I just talked about. But also the previous word informs the recurrent state at any, any given point in time. So this is somewhat redundant because the output word both contributes to the recurrent state, but also computes to the software prediction. But it should be somewhat clear why that is, because this output word, if it feeds into this recurrent state, only then predicts the word coming after that. And we want to use it immediately. And we also want to use the embedding to inform the recurrent state. OK, what else do we want? We want, obviously, this whole process of generating sentences and the output language being informed by the input. So there needs to be some kind of formulation of the input context, so some representation of that, also informing both the recurrent state and the prediction that is being made. Again, this is somewhat redundant. You could also just uh, have the input context only inform the recurrent state, but as the same argument goes before, we want to have a direct impact of it on the prediction that we make here. It's currently unclear what that input context is. Um, some representation of the input sentence is relevant at this point in time. So this is what we're going to turn to next. Um, but before we get to that, let's just keep be clear here about mathematically what's going on. So instead of just kind of having boxes with colors and arrows pointing between them, here's actually the math that is happening. So what do we have? We have the decoder state, so the hidden state of the decoder. It, at each point, gets informed by the previous decoder state, the embedding of the previous output word, and the input context. So it has three inputs. Here the uh, embedding, here the recurrent state, and here the input context. So these are basically three vectors. You can really think of them as being three vectors that can co get concatenated and then multiplied with a weight matrix. This is our trainable parameters. And then some kind of activation function. And again, there are various choices for this function. It might just be straightforward feedforward layer. So some activation function just operating on the vector that comes out of the matrix multiplication. But it could also be something like long short term memory cells or gated recurrent units. The output word y is uh, selected by first computing a vector ti, so this has the same size of vocabulary. So again, we basically take all the inputs that go into that. Um, this is now a slightly different formulation, so each input that goes into that gets multiplied with a weight mixed, matrix. These are the three inputs that go in there. Uh, the previous recurrent state, the um, embedding of the previous word and the current context vector and uh, that gets multiplied then with another matrix. Uh, that gives us a probability distribution over 
output words after we applied the softmax to that. Um, so we could make prediction by saying, okay, we always want to have the word that has the highest probability. So when we actually do translation, um, we probably want to pick the word that has the highest probability. So that's maybe the word that we're going to pick. We'll talk about decoding in a future lecture. So again, as we know, if we normalize TI, we can view it as a probability distribution. Um, also, what has happened here is that we have the output word yi that we chose, and that's then the embedding that is being used. So it's probably worth mentioning what's happening here. So here, if you have a softmax calculation, here it gives a it gives a probability distribution. Of which the probability distribution over output words, and we picked on one, we picked on the word does, and uh, that then leads us to make the next prediction. Although there are various different things that happen in training and decoding, and I'll have some more detail on that later. So the last thing to piece the puzzle is the attention mechanism. So we kind of hand way we talked about some input context, that is being relevant and it's still somewhat up in the air what that is. It's not even in this picture, but let's work towards it. So what we have is the encoder, which gave us these recurrent state, one going right to left and the other one going left to right. Then we have the last uh, hidden state of the decoder. That's a decoder state. And we're going to use this to compute something called attention. So the main basic idea is which word in the input should we pay attention to? So we're given the previous uh, decoder state, that's a single state, and then the representation of the input words. These are several words. Uh, it's also dynamic. It changes all the time. If you have short sentences, long sentences, the number of representations you have here depends on the number of words, so that's very variable. So the idea is to have some computation that's saying, given this state we are in, in the decoder, for each of the input words hj, so this is now the concatenation of the both forward and backward um, uh, recurrent states of the encoder, so what do you think about these two things? Can you give me a single number that says something about, given this hidden state and this representation of an input word, how important is it? So we're going to predict a number, a single number, from those two vectors, the recurrent state vector and the, uh, the representations of the input words. So this number, um, we then going to normalize, and this is, again, just softmax. It is literally spelled out as softmax. So we previously called it A. Now we're going to call it alpha. And it has two indices, i and j. And it should be clear why this is. So one is indexed by the current uh, state in the decoder. So this goes when we walk through the sentence, it increments by one each time. And then j is the index over the input words. So um, at each given point in time, when we produce translations, we are in a particular i position i. And then we look at all the relevant positions j. And this is also what this is normalized over here. The sum goes over this, um, the, the different input representations. So this basically gives us then a probability distribution over the input words. So the last remaining piece then is we're going to take this uh, calculation that we have here and use it in combination with the input words to compute the weighted sum. Um, so the illustration here is obviously not very informative. You really need to know what's the math, math, what the math is behind all that. It's very hard to kind of come up with any good idea how to illustrate attention. So just giving up here, we just draw a box and saying this is attention. Um, I think it's somewhat relevant is that yeah, the attention is informed by all of these states, all of this here, and by the previous decoder state. 
and then the weighted sum is a weighted sum over um, <coughs> these input representations for different words, guided by how much weight should be given to a particular word. So maybe we are in a particular part of a sentence, and now this is the most important uh, input word that matters, and the others are less important. So maybe then it basically adds up the vector by saying we're going to have 0 0.8 times this, and 0 0.05 times this, and 0 0.07 times this, and 0 0.01 times this, something like this. And then it's just here. These are the weights that go in there. And then we weight the vector accordingly. So this is also a bit of an odd thing to do. So you have now representations for all the input words. And somehow it's okay to just add them up and weigh them, and somehow that makes sense. This is a very common thing to do, though, in natural language processing. Okay, um, yeah, so this is just the last piece here. So once we have that input representation that feeds into the recurrent neural network, and we went over this earlier, this is a bit more complicated than that. It's also informed by the previously produced output word, and so on and so on. Okay, that's basically it. Uh, we'll now move on to aspects of training, and I'll show soon. Also, going to show a pretty comprehensive picture how the entire model looks like. Um, one thing uh, that is missing so far is uh, training. We need to have an error. So where do we get the error from? So our model makes predictions here. This is the softmax. Uh, that results in uh, a probability distribution of output words. So it gives every possible word in the vocabulary a probability, but we know what the correct output word is. So our training data tells us this sentence, first word of the sentence should be does. So what we're gonna do is we know what the correct word is. We check what, how much probability is given to the word. And then that is our error. This probability should be 1. If this probability is 1, then the error should be 0. And this is what our um, it's called cross entropy calculation tells us. So we're taking the log of that probability. So if our model likes exactly the right decision and gives this particular output word y sub i a probability of 1, then that log is 0. If, if it makes a wrong decision, if it gives it a very low score, if it gives it like 0 0.01, for instance, then log is going to get very high. So this is what we want to drive down. OK, um, before I show the next picture, just kind of keep in mind this is how we set this thing up. Last time, we had this idea of a computation graph that what we call deep neural networks is really just any kind of mathematical calculation that takes in parameter values. Uh, this is again our, our XOR here from last time. So it takes these parameter values and uh, the point of uh, uh, training is that we do some kind of propagation to optimize these parameter values. So this is the fully spelled out uh, computation graph for uh, the XOR function in our case now, uh, we have a much more complicated computation graph. Here it is. So you have an input sentence here. The house is big, period. And the output sentence, the house is the house is gross. Um, it somewhat happens that they're both the same length, but they don't have to have the same length. So the length that is computed here, that you, the number of states that are here, doesn't have to be the same as the length of uh, this is the output sentence here. So these could have different sense lengths. So there's no direct, chain, direct connection between particular words here to in the input side to particular words in the output side. Here is, is the connection between the two, and it goes over this entire block here. Um, what else is worth spelling out? Um, this graph is going to look different for different sentences, especially if the sentence has different length, then the graph is going to have different size. So this graph basically has to be constructed every single time for every sentence in different ways, because you have different length of input and output. That's fine. It just means the computation graph 
Once you have a training example, we can instantiate the configuration graph from that and spell it out. This was a challenge for these neural toolkits at, this, at some point. Now it's kind of a very common thing to do. OK, uh, this is the entire computation graph. Um, another way to look at it, um, what do we know about? What's the inputs and the outputs? So um, what is given to us is an input sentence and an output sentence. That's our training data. This is definitely what's given to us. And what we care about at the end is the cost here. So we do a lot of calculation only to get this error. And then we do backpropagation backwards to optimize on all the parameters. Each of these blocks is parameterized somehow um, with uh, usually parameter matrices. And that error helps us to then uh, drive back the updates to all these calculations. OK, um, that's basically the core of it. I'm just going to make some final remarks about batching and deep models, uh, but uh, we, we survived the, the technical part, mostly. Um, so um, there's already a large degree of parallelism here. Um, we have most of our computations are on vectors and matrices, which are really nice. That it can be done efficiently on CPU and especially GPU, which you can just do this multiple data, single instruction kind of operations very neatly. But we can have, can have even more parallelism by batching. That means we're going to process several sentence pairs at once. So that adds another dimension to all these tensors that we have. So if it's previously it was a scalar operation, now it goes over a whole set of sentences. So now it's a vector operation. If it was previously a vector, it's a matrix operation. If it was a matrix, now it's a 3D tensor operation. So then throwing these 3D tensor operations at the GPU makes the GPU really happy. That's something it can really utilize all its threads and compute very, very efficiently. I'm saying here typical batch size, 550 to 100 sentences. The real answer nowadays for how big the batches should be is whatever fits on a GPU. Um, this big unrolled graph here has to be now done for a lot of sentences. And so that gets really big. And uh, at some point, it's going to be gigabytes big. Um, consider all the intermediate values that are being computed. And that has to fit on a GPU. And basically, whatever fits on a GPU, we do. But it's in the order of 50 to 100 sentences, not that much bigger than that. OK, I said, uh, yeah, sentences have different lengths, so the computation graph looks quite differently. So what do you have to do when you batch? Uh, well, you roll out one computation graph over all sentences. So you pretty much have, go, have to go by the maximum length of a sentence in any of these batches. So if you batch, they have different lengths of sentences. And in this case, this year is the longest one. So the computation graph has to be spelled out for that length. That means there are obviously some cells that aren't being used. There are some sentences that have fewer input words than the sentence pair. And then we have to basically uh, fill that up with zeros or figure out, basically ensure also that that doesn't cause any kind of updates. Uh, no attention is ever paid to it, for instance, and so on. So all that has to be done. But the other big problem is that you have all this wasted calculation here. So this is just you know operating on zeros and still does all the number crunching. So we don't want to do that. So what, what could be done is to break up the training data in mini batches. Uh, so sort them by sentence length and then have these mini batches to throw each of them at the GPU at a time and then have the calculation. Um, you definitely want to then at first add up all the updates you get from this and then apply your uh, parameter update, the optimization. So you first compute all the gradients this way, but then when you do the updates, you do it for all of these together. Otherwise, you get updates from short sentences and updates from long sentences and updates from short sentences and updates from really long sentences. And that throws, obviously, the model in kind of very strange perturbations. So um, here, just kind of a big picture of how a training is going to be organized. 
So the first thing we're going to do is we shuffle the corpus. Um, parallel training data typically comes from different sources. Or maybe you have like a lot of text from the European Parliament that we talked about already. Let like maybe you also have some news text, or you have some text from the United Nations, or you have some web crawl data. And each of this data is going to have different characteristics. So if you walk through the training and keep updating, you first drifting. If you would first just process all the Europol data, you would drift towards kind of a model that's good for Europol, and then it's going to make a hard turn, and it's going to become a model that's good for news data, and then it becomes a model that is good for crawl data, and so on. So you don't want to do that. So you want to randomly shuffle up the corpus. Then you break it up into maxi batches. Then you break up each maxi batch into mini batches, as was spelled out in the previous illustrations, and then process each mini batch update. Um, uh, the parameters and once done you repeat so the update of the parameter happens actually every maxi batch. So once it's then walked all the way through the corpus, that's one epoch of training, uh, we're gonna repeat this. Typically five to fifteen epochs are needed, although if you have low resource conditions uh, where you maybe have corpora of uh, training corpora of maybe a million words, maybe even less, you might actually do this even more, maybe you run that hundred times. If you have massive amounts of training data, you might not even run five epochs over there, all that data. Um, a final word on uh, deeper models. Uh, so we talked about this in the context of language models already. So uh, we said, yeah, these are our shallow models. So in, in a way, they seem very complex, but the complexity comes from the length of the sentences. That doesn't come from the depth of the calculation, and we said, oh, we can also do multiple layers of recurrent neural networks. That one layer informs the next layer, and so on. And there are different ways to set this up. Um, similar things can be done for um, the decoder, where you also then have uh, these different uh, uh, calculations, and you can mix uh, decode. Uh, transition states and uh, uh, deeply stacked states, so either errors going this way or errors going that way. And the same thing can be done at the encoder. Um, so one nice property of the encoder is obviously that in all scenarios you have the entire input sentence available you, to you from the beginning. The decoder you often build the output sentence, especially at tests like one word at a time, at training time, you do have it all, but at test time, you produce one word at a time. But in any scenario, you have the entire input sentence. So you can also deeply stack these left to right and right to left calculations. We so have first a right to left layer, and that informs then the left to right layer, which then informs the left to right. So you can do that too. So all these things have been done, and there's various configurations that have been shown to be more successful than others. And that's it for today. So this is, we got up to the point of tr training these models. And next time we're going to take a closer look at decoding. And hopefully decoding is not going to be very surprising to you because it draws on a lot of the ideas that we already developed in um, decoding for phrase-based models. But it also has significant differences. So more on that in the next lecture.